French army in the American barracks, you'd be saying the food over here is great. Because whilst it's fine, it's really not the same as being in France. But, uh, um, so you've done the complicated bit, and I've really got the easy bit. And my slides are much more boring, and there's a lot of graphs. If you want to interrupt as I go through, I am very comfortable with that. And if there are things that you don't understand, I'm very happy to try and explain that. What I'm going to do is talk to you about data that, uh, that Troy and I and many others have been involved in gathering to try and give you information um, to try and help you make decisions. Now, I'm warning you that these are data that are published. You can, you, you can access them, and many of you may already have them. Um, and there are data in those two particular publications on mortality, which I'm going to be talking about. So I don't want to upset anybody, but it is part of the data that's out there. And I think it's important that we have the whole picture. But just to warn you, and if you think you can't cope with that, then I don't mind if you walk out at this stage. But um, I think it's our job to be honest with you about the whole range of stuff, OK? So Troy's already given you a very good explanation of CD40 ligand deficiency or, or X-linked hyper-IgM. Uh, but I think this concept of the B cell and the T cell is really important. So T cells, and particularly a, a subset of T cells, T helper cells, you can think of as the orchestra for kind of conducting the immune response. Um, and in particular, uh, there's this helper subset which express the CD40 ligand molecule, which is the one that's missing in patients with X-linked hyper-IgM syndrome. And that's important because B cells are the cells that make antibody. And for a long time, people thought that hyper-IgM syndrome was an antibody deficiency. And therefore, if you give replacement antibody, that would be okay. Um, and the reason for that is because actually the CD40 ligand interacts with a, another molecule called CD40 on the B cell to help the B cell make more antibody. But unfortunately, it's not quite as straightforward as that because although that's true, this same CD40 molecule is found on other cells as well. And I've just lost the arrow, so I'll start doing what uh, Troy does. Here on the Kupfer cell, which is a sort of marrow macrophage cell, which is important for gobbling up um, germs, and also on other macrophage cells as well. So in CD40 ligand deficiency, you can't turn on the B cell to make antibody other than the IgM, but you also can't activate these cells to help get rid of germs as well. So actually, CD40 ligand deficiency is not a B cell deficiency. That is part of it. But I think today we would consider it rather a, a T cell or a combined immune deficiency. And that's really important. And actually, this graph is, illustrates this rather well. This is uh, data published from France, which shows the type of infection that you can get in the lung. And in the bottom line, it's patients who have no antibody whatsoever. They have a B cell deficiency, and you can see that they get these infections a lot, whereas patients with hyper-IgM syndrome don't get so many of these bacterial infections in the lung. They're better protected because they actually do have some antibody. It's the IgM antibody, whereas the ones at the bottom have no antibody whatsoever. However, in CD40 ligand deficiency, we worry about pneumocystis gerevechi, or uh, pneumocystis carini, as it used to be called, pneumonia. That's a T cell problem. It's not a B cell problem, it's a T cell problem. We worry about cryptosporidium, which is a T cell problem. It's nothing to do with antibody deficiency. It's because T cells and macrophages are not working properly. And then you can get other problems related to the cryptosporidium, which are side effects of that infection causing these things. So um, it's always good to be able to put you two into a talk, um, just, just because it is. Um, there's a question here, yeah, go on. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we could say fairly confidently that sclerosing cholangitis is due to cryptosporidium infection, and that probably the liver cancer or the pectocellular carcinoma is related to sclerosing cholangitis. 
these other things are probably not related to clostridium and other issues that we see in, uh, in CD40 ligand deficiency. I'm less worried uh, really about the neutropenia. This may be slightly more of an antibody problem because of the sorts of um, infections that you get. We also see in patients with B-cell problems. Yeah, but they do exist and they're important. So the reason I put you two here is, apart from the fact that I'm a fan, on this particular album, which was actually uh, has a very high um, American strength to it, there's a song called Running to Stand Still. And that doesn't entirely explain what I mean for the next bit, but one of the problems that we have is that we're not talking about today. The data I am going to show you are not today's data. They are old data. And always the information that you're looking at is yesterday. So one of the important papers that was published that Troy was involved with and I was involved with was published in 2016, that's three years ago. But the data from it is probably at least 10 years old because by the time we've collected it and finally published it and it's now three years old published, it's way out of date. So although I'm going to show you data, it's actually not necessarily what happens today apart from the very last lot which I've collected from our centre which we haven't yet published, uh, and is uh, fairly current. So I think the first thing to say is that hyper-IgM syndrome is not a benign disease. Um, and one of the problems that people worry about when they're thinking about transplant is it's a, a dangerous treatment with side effects, but we're actually not talking about transplanting healthy people walking down the street. We're talking about transplanting patients who have a disease which is not benign of itself. And this was taken from the paper that I was explaining, published three years ago, which was an analysis of 176 patients with hyper-IgM syndrome. Some of those patients were transplanted. Um, and I don't want to focus too much on the transplant results from this paper, because the next one is, is more detailed about the transplant. But you can see that without a transplant, your outcome is worse than in the dotted line if you have had a transplant. These graphs show uh, percentages of patients. So this is the probability of surviving when you're zero, when you're 10 years old, when you're 20 years old, when you're 30 years old, when you're 40 years old. And so as you get older, there are less people surviving than maybe you would expect, given uh, the problems that are going on. And those who've got hyper-IgM syndrome are not doing as well as those that have hyper-IgM syndrome and have a transplant. So I think the first thing to think about is we're not talking about a disease which is okay to have, that actually having hyper-IgM syndrome is a problem in itself. And therefore we're thinking about how best we can treat that. And that's what we're thinking about. Um, what we know from that paper is if you've got liver disease, then you do much worse than if you haven't got liver disease. And again, that was one of the problems I was showing you with cryptosporidium, with the sclerosing cholangitis and then potentially with the liver cancer, which are complications which are T-cell problems which are not solved by being on immunoglobulin treatment. And actually, we don't really have any good ways of trying to prevent them. We've got things that we can give, but they're not always that effective. And within that paper um, that uh, uh, Teresa de Morena um, published, I think she's in with you now, isn't she, Troy? Um, I think she was in Texas at the time that she put this big manuscript together. Uh, in, there's a table which lists causes of death of patients with hyper-IgM. And these are the patients who have not had a transplant. And you can see the malignancy in the gallbladder and rectal carcinoma, gallbladder is part of the liver. Uh, uh, cholangiocarcinoma is liver. I don't know where the neuroendocrine tumors were, but you can see there are the liver cancers and liver failure sclerosing cholangitis and cirrhosis, liver failure, some infections like immune cystis. Um, but actually it's these problems, particularly with the liver, that we worry about, that actually the longer you live, the more likely you are eventually to encounter cryptosporidium, which then some years or many years later is going to lead to some of these problems with the uh, cholangitis, the cirrhosis, and potentially with the liver cancer. So what we're trying to think about is how can we actually prevent that happening, okay? And that's why we think about doing a transplant. 
So treatment, immunoglobulin substitution, uh, prophylaxis against the pneumocystis with uh, cotramoxazole, cryptosporidial prophylaxis I think is tricky. We say boil the water, I don't know what you say over here. Uh, don't use the bottled water because actually you can get cryptosporidium in bottled water. So if you've got bottled water then boil it still. Um, but of course do you brush your teeth in boiled water? Or do you wash your salad in boiled water? So ideally yes. Do you do that every single time? And if you're out for a meal in a restaurant, has the restaurant boiled the water before they wash the salad? So it, you know, it's, it's a nice ideal, but actually in the real world, it's really difficult to do that every single time. Um, we use azithromycin, which is an antibiotic. It may have some help in preventing cryptosporidium, um, and there are some data to support that, but I think uh, not brilliant. And then there are some treatments if you've actually got cryptosporidium, but to my mind, the best treatment for crypto is a T-cell that works. Um, and actually, these other things might hold it a bit, but they don't get rid of it. And if it's there, then you might still get the liver problems. And so we come to transplant. So actually, I think one of the first papers about transplant was one that we published from Europe um, a little while ago now, uh, back in 2004. Uh, and we looked at 38 patients who'd had a transplant and looked at their outcomes. Um, and the overall survival of transplant was about 70%. Uh, most of those had good engraftment, uh, but some of them did lose the graft, as Troy was saying. Um, and the cure rate was about 60%. Um, and we found in that study that pre-existing lung damage was a real problem. So if you've got lung damage from infections, that adversely affected the outcome of transplant, and we couldn't find anything else that did that, but it's a small number of patients. Uh, and one of the things that we thought was that actually further studies will determine optimal timing and type of transplant, if we're thinking about that. And so, um, as Akiva alluded to at the beginning, and as Troy has alluded to, uh, that we have just published a big manuscript, and it is actually quite a lot of paper, uh, but it was a huge study which has taken... Well, uh, Francesca Ferrua, who was my Italian fellow who started doing the study, I think it was about 2012 or 2013 when she started, and we've only just published it today. So again, running to stand still, it was published. In fact, it's published this month. I found out this morning that it's actually in print in the journal in June 2019, but it's out of date, okay? Uh, and it's taken six or seven years to put that data together, so although it's only out this week or last week, it's already at least six or seven years out of date and probably more than that. And so we need to take those data with a pinch of salt because as Troy has said, things are moving forward all the time and the way we're thinking about transplanting today is different even from six or seven years ago. So these are useful data to have to look at but they don't necessarily tell you what is happening today, okay? So I'm going to go through some of these results, and uh, they're quite complicated. Now, this paper is freely available. If you go on to PubMed, and you, uh, or if you Google it, you can find it, and you're able to download it, because we made it freely available for anybody to download. Um, so it's, it's there for you, and I don't know if Akiva's already sent it round, but it's there, and it's available for you to look at. So we had 130 patients, not more than, it was exactly 130, uh, from 36 transplant centres worldwide, including some in the States, and I think uh, Seattle were involved, is this as well? You, uh, okay. you, weren't you weren't asked? No, okay. Well, we knew, we knew. <laughs> um, and there were a number of things that we found, and I'm going to go through these in more detail, uh, but actually, year of transplant, so 2000 or, or afterwards was better, uh, a young age at transplant, and if you hadn't got any organ damage before the transplant, were associated with good outcomes. Um, 2000 is a magic year because, of course, it's a new millennium, but it's often a year that we use to describe, if you like, epochs in transplant. And there are a number of things that were happening by about 2000 that have meant that since then, transplants have generally been better than before then. And one of them Troy's already talked about, which is that we can do the HLA matching better. And in 1980, when we thought we got an HLA match, actually, if we looked at it again today, it probably wouldn't be.
a match, it wouldn't be as well matched as we think it is. So we can do better matching, but there's a whole number of other things that have changed as well. Our conditioning, I think, is better and safer. We've got better drugs to support patients through transplant. We're more experienced at transplant. So although I started in about 2000, it was nothing to do with that, that we're better. I think it was just that our techniques and our technology and our knowledge was better. So these are complicated uh, graphs, and I'll, I'll talk you through some of them. Um, so this is survival outcome, and again, it's historic data, remember, and this is what there are. So we have transplant at the top after 2000, before the age of five years, because younger age is a better time to transplant. It's not actually nothing to do with age, but if you're younger, you won't have collected all of the complications that you get through having CD40 ligand deficiency, and therefore, transplant tends to be more straightforward and is more likely to be successful. Um, actually, in 2000 and beyond, if you're older, still good results, actually. Um, if we do transplants or looked at transplants before then, then we found that the survival was not so good. And this is number of patients at the beginning, and then over time, how many patients are left in the follow-up. And you can see, before 2000 and more than 10 years old, it's pretty awful, actually. There's only about 20 and I think actually we were part of what was happening then. We recognized suddenly that hyper IgM syndrome is not a B cell problem, it's a T cell problem. The gene was only uh, recognized in about 1996. Um, and then we'd got a whole load of patients in their teens, uh, late teens, who were really sick. And we suddenly realized actually antibody treatment isn't going to do the job. And many of those patients were put forward for transplant. They'd already got lung disease and liver disease, and many of those patients didn't survive. And I think that's partly why that curve looks so awful. And actually, that was our experience as well, and I'll show you that in more detail. And, and, and actually, this reflects its organ damage before transplant. So lung and particularly liver, if you were before 2000 or after 2000, there's no organ damage, you do very well. If you have got organ damage, even in the the new era, when transplant is good, you do worse than if you don't have any organ damage. And we know from what Troy was saying about the chemotherapy that we're giving and some of those attacking cells through the transplant process, if you've already got liver damage or you've already got lung damage, then that just becomes a lot more difficult to manage than if you've got a fairly healthy liver and fairly healthy lungs. Um, well, I want to talk about this. I think we're going to skip this for the moment. Oh, no, actually, I'm not, briefly. Um, so um, one of the things that we can look at is the, the stem cell source, and again, Troy was talking about that, bone marrow versus peripheral blood versus core blood. Actually, I want to ignore that, because I think that's old data, and it's not, no longer relevant. Um, and Troy was talking about mismatch transplants, where you do a fancy T-cell depletion, and the outcome from T-cell depleted transplants is if you look at the historic data. But actually, today, I don't think there's any difference on the donor. So it doesn't matter if you've got a matched sibling or a matched and related donor, or you do a fancy T cell depleted transplant, I think the outcomes are pretty much the same. Um, and uh, I mean, one of the problems we've got is we're in a, to a large degree, an evidence free zone here. There's not a huge amount of information about CD40 ligand deficiency or hyper IgM. So sometimes we need to look at what's the evidence for other primary deficiencies. And these are data from our center in Newcastle for chronic granulomatous disease. It's a different disease completely, um, but it's looking at the T cell defeated transplant, the unrelated donor transplant, and the, uh, the sibling transplant. And you can see that these lines are pretty much the same compared to um, donors here, where it's all over the place. So I think today, to a degree, it doesn't really matter which donor you use. I think I would agree with Troy that I would be cautious about using a carrier donor, but I think there are plenty of alternatives that would make me fairly happy about thinking about transplant. So one of the things that Troy was talking about was that you can lose the graft or you can partially lose the graft. Um, one of the things that we did, we weren't able to get information on all of those 130 patients, but uh, information on uh, more than 100, 
we were looking at um, whether the donor chimerism was 100% or whether it was less than 100% or whether it had gone completely. At six months of follow up, at 12 months of follow up, and at the last follow up, which was at least more than a year. Um, and what you can see is that, sure, some patients had completely lost their graft. Some patients only had mixed chimerism, some donor, some of the patient, but actually the majority had full donor chimerism, and importantly, there wasn't a change over time. So actually, it, it, I think it normally takes six to 12 months, actually, to work out what's going on. And occasionally, we do see late failures, where you start to, you continue to lose graft, and you may eventually lose it. But I think these often are, um, showing that actually what you're left with by about 12 months is fairly stable. And partial chimerism, in my mind, is okay. I can live with a patient who's got 30-40% donor chimerism because most of those patients are well and are not needing any more treatment. Um, now, what I wanted to show you particularly here was this thing about viral so we know that in CD40 ligand deficiency that there's a T-cell problem, but it's a fairly specific T-cell problem. So the T-cells are quite good at doing two things. One is rejecting a graft. The second is fighting viruses. So if you've got a viral infection, normally with CD40 ligand deficiency, you'll clear it okay. And the problem I think we see sometimes in transplant is that viruses appear through the transplant. And if you've got a few of the patient's own T cells left through transplant and a virus appears, they might start attacking that virus to get rid of it. And then you get an expansion of the recipient T cells, and I think at that point you're a little bit more likely to end up with mixed chimerism or maybe even ultimately rejection because the patient's T cells have had something to do through transplant and then once they've cleared the virus, they're looking for other things to do. There's a lot of them, and you either end up with mixed chimerism or complete rejection. Um, and that's not true for all other immune deficiencies. It is true for some, but not many that we treat. And that's, I think, maybe why transplanting CD40 ligand may be a little bit more tricky, because actually the T cells in many respects are pretty good, just in a particular respect they're not. Um, and I think that was quite an interesting finding that the viruses through transplant patients tended to have a worse outcome in terms of chimerism than in patients that didn't get that viral reactivation. There were deaths in this big group of 130 patients and actually the majority of these are deaths that we see through transplant, unfortunately. So infection, which might be early or late, uh, particularly if you've got graft-versus-host disease, uh, graft rejection was a problem. Liver failure or multi-organ failure probably reflects the status of the patient before they came to transplant. So you don't normally die of liver failure if you've got a very healthy liver before you go into transplant. But if you've got a sick liver with damage, then that makes transplant more difficult and that might cause a problem. The progressive neurodegeneration, I think, is related, again, to the viral infection in the head that you were pointing out. And I think if you do a transplant when that's happening, again, you often end up with problems. And unfortunately, it's not always possible to know that when you do the transplant, whether that virus is there or not. So the key messages from this paper were that transplant can be curative in patients with CD40 ligand deficiency. But it's best if it's performed early. Um, I mean, we found 10 years. I don't think 10 is a particularly magic number but um, earlier rather than later, especially before you have got organ damage and especially liver damage. The, actually, in this paper, a better survival was found with matched donors um, transplanting early after diagnosis and the use of myeloablative regimens. And again, Troy talked a little bit about that. So these are conditioning regimens which are the grand rather than the petite. So we can use in patients... Um, very gentle conditioning regimens, but I think in CD40 ligand deficiency, you need to use heavier chemotherapy. And we got a worse outcome by using a more gentle chemotherapy. And that causes a conflict, because if you've got a patient who's got a sick liver and sick lungs, you might want to use the gentle chemotherapy. 
but you may not get such a good outcome from the transplant and if you've already got lung and liver damage you may not get such a good outcome from the transplant. So those are sort of two things I think that go together. I think the good news is, and Troy is one of the only centres I think in the States, um, in Europe many centres are using uh, a chemotherapy which is heavy duty but less toxic. That's triosulfan. So it's a heavy duty chemotherapy that will do the job but it's less toxic than the older heavy duty chemotherapy regimens and it's something that we've been very keen on using in Newcastle and there's a number of centres around uh, Europe using that. Um, it's just in America it's a bit more um, so isolated. Be so it has to be done on a clinical trial. Okay. So what I want to very quickly do now is run you through our specific experience. Um, and we've now transplanted 19 patients with CD40 ligand deficiency. I think this is correct. The reason I say that is we've got a patient who's 60 days post-transplant. I can't remember if he's in this graph or not. We've also got a patient who's starting chemotherapy. I don't even know what the day is today. I possibly started yesterday, but very soon. And then we've got another patient who's coming in in the next uh, few weeks. So those last two patients are definitely not part of this. The, the, other, the first one might be. Um, but you can see that most of these, but not all, are diagnosed um, early, but there's a range. The, the older ones are more historic, and these are all of our patients. Median age at transplant, again, is young, but there's a range, and the early ones tended to be the older ones when people suddenly realised that this isn't a benign disease and we need to do something about it. Um, we've used different donors, matched family, matched unrelated, uh, mismatched unrelated, and we've done one haploidentical transplant. Different stem cell sources, marrow mainly, usually these days we're using peripheral blood, and although the outcomes in that big series were not so good for peripheral blood, our peripheral blood experience is very good indeed, and we tend to prefer that these days. Uh, different conditioning regimens, but you can see that the fludarabine melphalan is the, the low, the more gentle one, if you like. Triosulfan, or combinations of triosulfan, or busulfan, and cyclophosphamide are the heavy duty ones. And those are the ones that we would recommend, and we're using triosulfan pretty much for everything these days. Um, those are just the cell doses, not particularly interesting for you. So this is the overall survival for the entire cohort. I'm going to come back to this graph in the next talk. Um, but you can see actually, for a disease that is quite a horrible disease, an overall survival of 80% I think is okay over a 25-year period. But since 2000, it's 100%. Now, it's not going to stay 100%. I don't know how many of you drive a car, most I guess. And when you think about getting into the car, do you think about the fact that there might be an accident? Never. But actually it happens, all right? If you drive a car, people die on the road. If you do a transplant, at some point there is going to be a problem. And although we've got brilliant data at the moment, it's not many patients, although it's quite a long time period, and we're going to lose a patient at some point, even though the results are very good. So 100% is great, but it won't stay 100% because at some point there will be an issue. But you can see that, again, there's a huge difference between the 2000 plus and the before 2000. And that's mainly because these before 2000 were the older, sicker patients. I think today, if we were transplanting them, the outcome would be better than there because we know how to do it better. But even so, the outcome wouldn't be as good as patients who are younger and generally well. Um, and you can see that because we've got an age less than five years and an age more than five years. Most of the more than five years are in the, the, that kind of historic period. Um, and in fact, the death in the less than five years was also in that historic period. Um, so it was a, and there's a specific issue with that transplant, um, but that's one death. Um, and otherwise, all of those patients from ever since we started have survived. So the predictors of overall survival were... Um, age at transplant really is the main predictor when we look at everything mixed together. All of these other things, age, the interval between diagnosis and transplant, conditioning and donor, were important when we looked at only those. But when you look at everything together, the biggest predictor of, of outcome was going to be the age at transplant. And that's why... Uh, so anything that's 0 0.05 or smaller we think is important. It's a kind of 
statistical decision that's kind of been decided how we interpret these. So 0 0.38 isn't significant, 0 0.03 is significant. Okay, so that's the only thing I think that really matters. An age at transplant, again, usually reflects the amount of organ damage that you've got. So, I think transplant is curative, and we'll talk maybe a little bit about that in more detail in the next talk. And most of our patients, I think other than two, are off immunoglobulin, and they're certainly off other prophylaxis. Um, and I think that the best outcomes for transplant are at an early age before significant organ damage, and with some form of myeloablative conditioning, and we would recommend a low toxicity myeloablative conditioning, and the lack of viral infection is associated with better engraftment. Um, and I would argue that we should consider transplant early. And one of the things that upsets me as a doctor treating patients is that I get referred patients late who are sick. And the first conversation we ever have is when already the risk is very high. And as parents, you may have very firm decisions about whether you wish to consider transplant or not. And that's great, but I would prefer that you're allowed to start thinking about that earlier when maybe the outcome is going to be better. And so I would argue conversations should start early. Now you may decide, young child, well, do you know we'd prefer not to go for it. But I'd rather you were able to make that decision than until it's really quite late and then you have those conversations when the risks are much higher. So I'm not saying do transplant early, although I would recommend that, but I think you should have the opportunity to consider transplant early um, because then the decisions are yours and your family's in conjunction with your physician rather than just the physician's decision. So there's lots of people helped me put these data together, particularly for the big study Francesca, um, who's done a tremendous job with that. Um, and I'm happy to take questions if you've got any. Yeah. adults didn't get to be adults, they, d they died of the disease. Um, now we do recognise that there are some older patients who do have CD40 ligand deficiency. Um, in fact, the patient that I'm not sure is in our graph, who's only about three, two months post-transplant, um, his grandfather was, in fact I saw them, what's today? Friday. When did I arrive? So I saw him, I saw him on Wednesday with his 57-year-old grandfather, who also has CD40 ligand deficiency. Um, within Europe, and I'm not sure about the States, there are some groups beginning to think about transplanting adults with all sorts of immune deficiencies. And therefore, I wouldn't say, if you're an adult, you shouldn't consider it. But I think it needs a much more careful decision than it does for children. And the reason I say that is because of the risk-benefit ratio. If you've got the rest of your life ahead of you and you are three or four and the transplant is likely to be fairly straightforward, it's probably worth thinking about carefully. If you're in your 30s or 40s and you've got lung and liver damage, then the risk of transplant is much higher and you've already shown that you're in a slightly different group to many patients because you've got to 30 or 40 or 50. So I, I think there are issues with particularly the older patients with, um, with CD40 ligand deficiency. 
and I'm not sure we've always got good solutions at the moment. Um, transplant may be an answer for some, but I think it needs to be considered fairly carefully and probably done in, I mean, I think all of these should be done in centres that know what they're doing, but particularly in adult transplant. Um, the, the patient that I saw, uh, the 49-year-old, I will talk to our adult team about whether transplant would be appropriate. And they may say, actually, we think it's too risky. Um, and otherwise, at the moment, apart from that other list of treatments that I put up, I don't think there are many good options today, but people are working on options. And one of those might be gene therapy. Now, that's not going to be around the corner this year or next year, but it might be available in, I don't know, five years' time, perhaps, perhaps on a trial basis. So I think yeah, older patients, it is much more tricky. Um, for younger patients, I think it's, it's easier. I don't know if you want to say anything. No, I was just going to you know, just comment, too. I think you know, the point you raise about, you know, the, 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 oftentimes adult bone marrow transplant centers, they, um, they really have specialized over the years in transplanting patients who have malignant disease, so cancer of various types. And non malignant diseases like aplastic and things like that, that are a different, a different kill of fish than, than patients with any deficiency. And as a result, there's not very many centers in the United States who do, who, who transplant adults who have very much experience at all with transplanting patients with immune deficiencies. So I think if you're an adult who is affected, you, you have to be very careful. Uh, even, even I think there's a, there's even smaller number of centers who I would think about um, sending a, an adult to or having an adult transplant that than for pediatrics for, for this disease because there are just not adult there's not that many adult centers who are that experienced with transplanting immune deficiencies in general. So. I think one of the things I worry about, and I'm likely to be shot down here, um, but adult transplanters think they're God and they can do anything, and they'll have a pop at doing a CD40 ligand deficiency because that's, you know, and actually if you ask them what it's about, they have no idea. They don't know any of the stuff I've just shown you. They'll know some of the stuff that Troy's talked about, the basics, but they don't appreciate that this is a different disease to anything they've ever seen before. And I think some of the problems are different. Transplanting any patient with primary immunodeficiency is very different from transplanting a patient with leukaemia. Uh, which is mainly what the adult transplanters do, leukaemia and myeloma. And so I would caution just going to someone down the road for a transplant for, um, for a, any immune deficiency and certainly hyper-IgM, definitely in an adult, because they think they can have a go at it. You really need to talk to people that know about it, and they may say, no way, it's too dangerous. But actually... Those are people who know what they're talking about. In the, in the UK, we're lucky. Emma Morris in uh, London in UCL and actually Venetia Bigley in Newcastle are taking on adult transplants. And that's why I'm going to refer my patient to see Venetia. But I, I mean, I, I know already that she may well say no. Now, Emma's results, and actually our results are pretty good for adults. They're about an 80% survival, not as good as children, but better than leukemia, actually. Uh, but even so, it is a very different, as, as Troy said, it is a different kettle of fish. It's a lot more risky, and you really do need to be a specialist to know what you're talking about.